All right. Hello, everybody. After having talked uh, at length about the signaling in uh, the nervous tissue, we had a lot of lectures about that. Um, the course has now moved quite significantly towards the immune system. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, today is a certain part of signaling in the immune system, namely the mediators of inflammation. So we're going to be talking about the biochemical side, how these mediators are synthesized, uh, yeah, mostly synthesized, and how they work. Um, but before we get to that, uh, let's talk a little bit about inflammation. What, what is inflammation? Swelling. <laughs> is it swelling? Or tissue swells up. So that would be one sign of inflammation. Okay. But what is inflammation? Yeah. Okay, so it's a, it's a response, physiological, yeah, it could be pathological as well. Uh, but yes, so it's a response of the organism which has been developed uh, by evolution to some kind of damage. And the damage can be caused by infection, it can be caused by trauma, it can be caused by all sorts of things, okay? So when a tissue is damaged, inflammation usually ensues. But of course, as you will hear and have heard a little bit already about that, is that sometimes we can have pathological inflammation where an inflammation starts maybe due to some damage in the beginning, but then it spreads out out of control and it causes uh, autoimmune diseases, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, of course, pathological types of inflammation. And today, towards the end of the lecture, we'll also talk a little bit about how we can influence the signaling in inflammation, usually to inhibit it. Um, and that is mostly relevant to these conditions where the inflammation is unwanted. So either when it's causing too much pain or too much problem, or when it has gone completely out of control and we need to stop it because it's starting to damage normal tissues and not being a physiological response. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But since you started talking about the classical signs of inflammation, what are they? So you, you mentioned swelling. So swelling is definitely one of them. Redness. Redness, indeed. Heat, so the, the place when we, usually when we're talking about local inflammation, then the, the place where the inflammation is, is warmer than the rest of it. But of course, we can also have fever, which is done by, a, it's a slightly different thing, but also we can have fever where the whole body is, gets warmer uh, and serves some purpose. All right, what else? Not, not really, I mean, the, the, the heat, well, do you know what, what produces, what it, how the heat is produced when there's local inflammation? Well, interleukin-1 could be a mediator of that, but why is, why is an inflamed part of the body, a finger or whatever, why is it warmer than the rest of it? Hmm? Because of the blood flow, indeed. Okay, so it's not that the, the, the part of the body just heats up by some endogenous process, but just more blood flow in the place causes it to be, to be warmer, okay? So that, that on its own will not damage the tissue because of course it doesn't get any warmer than the blood. So, so that's not really, um, but there is some kind of a, yeah, I mean, not damage the tissue, but what is, what is the remaining sign? Did we have all of them? Pain. There's pain, very good. So there's pain, very important. And the fifth one, which is sort of non-classical. Sometimes you know, there is no pain when, it's, when something is inflamed. Of course, it's possible, but we're talking about the classical signs of inflammation. Loss of function. Loss of function or damaged function. Okay, so these are the five, let's say, classical. The classical ones from antiquity are actually the four, uh, and loss of function would be the fifth, which is added to those. Now, of course, there are many cases of inflammation, especially systemic inflammation, that do not have these signs or just have some of them, okay? So it's, it's not that we can find any kind of inflammation by looking at these signs, but the majority of the classical inflammations that we can see in, in a patient would have one or more of these signs, usually all of them. Now, these typical classical signs of inflammation are mediated by signaling molecules. So all, all of them are not caused, but mediated by some signaling molecules. And you've already heard about some of them, and some were already mentioned here. What are the mediators of inflammation that you may have heard about? Cytokines. The cytokines, 
There's histamine. We talked about histamine quite a bit. So histamine is done, but it is, of course, an important mediator for inflammation. We have cytokines. We have interleukins, lots of them, yeah, all sorts of numbers there, okay? And they do have different functions. So there's interleukin-1, which is kind of the generic interleukin that can be produced by almost any tissue and causes many, many different things. But all the other interleukins have their specific functions. What else? We have nitric oxide, very good. Again, something that we already talked about, but it's an important thing, both in the signaling of inflammation and in the in case of infection, it also serves to fight the, uh, the infection. So, yeah. There was some other suggestion? Yeah? Growth factors usually are not so much involved in inflammation, but maybe in the restitution, so in, in, in healing the inflammation. But yeah, sure. Et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of these, with the exception of histamine, are chemically, chemically speaking, they are with the exception of histamine and nitric oxide, they're all peptides, proteins, okay? So from a biochemical point of view, they're not very interesting because they are all synthesized in the same way. What is the way that these peptides are synthesized? Somebody at the back? How are peptides, proteins synthesized? Anybody? Don't be shy. Anybody at the back? How are proteins synthesized? In, just pick up. They are synthesized from amino acids and the, the pathway or where, where does it happen? So in the cell, yes. Uh, in the nucleus, only a small part of the process occurs in the nucleus. But the actual synthesis of the protein occurs where? Where? In the endoplasmic reticulum, and specifically, there's a little organelle that does the whole thing. Let's just be patient. Yeah, what is it? In the ribosome, okay, very good. So, of course, all the proteins, peptides are synthesized in ribosomes by translating mRNA. So, again, from bio biochemical point of view, not interesting, done, you should all know that, and there is no problem with that. But today, I want to talk about a set of of signaling molecules that we haven't mentioned yet and that do have some very interesting biochemistry. And those are called eicosanoids. Eicosanoids. And now, of course, we, or I imagine that we have some Greek speakers here, so can somebody tell us uh, what word are eicosanoids derived from? The name, yeah? from number 20, correct, which is eco C, yeah. Uh, why are they derived from the word for 20? Well, because they all contain 20 carbons, okay? So they do contain 20 carbons. Um, yeah, pretty much all of them. Um, and they are all derived from fatty acids. So they are fatty acids derivatives. Again, when we talked about all the different signaling molecules in the nervous system, we said that the majority of them, almost all of them, are derivatives of amino acids. And there was one exception that I mentioned is also a derivative of fatty acid. Does anyone remember? We didn't talk about them very much, but does anyone remember about the, the group of signaling molecules that are fatty acid derivatives, but are in the brain, in the central nervous system? Very good, endocannabinoids, okay? They're also derivatives of fatty acids. But we'll leave them aside because they're very, very different. Eicosanoids are, as I said, they have, they have 20 carbons and they are derivatives of 20 carbon fatty acids. Do you know any fatty acids that contain 20 carbons? Okay, so we know arachidonic acid. What kind of acid is that? It's? It's polyunsaturated, very good. So it has more than one double bond. How many, in fact? It has four double bonds. Okay, how many carbons? 20, we just said that, right? So for arachidonic acid, we can use the, the usual notation that we use for describing polyunsaturated fatty acids, in biology at least. So it's C20, it has four double bonds, 
Okay, so that alone tells us about the systematic name of the acid. What would it be? There are 20 carbons, four double bonds. So systematically speaking, our ketonic acid is, sorry, I don't, yeah. So there are 20 carbons, so we already have a word for 20, for 20. So eco C, which is for 20. There are four double bonds. Eco C tetraenoic acid. Okay, eco C tetraenoic acid. But this systematic name still would describe more than one compound. It would still describe many different compounds, not just arachidonic acid. So what do we need more to make sure that we're really talking about arachidonic acid? We have to have the position of the double bonds, right? There are four double bonds and they can be anywhere, right? However, and you probably know that, when we talk about biologically important, especially in biomedicine, in human biology, biologically important fatty acids, usually we don't give the positions of all the double bonds. We could, it's just not done very often. Why can we get away with not telling the positions of all of them? Hmm? We can just use the first one, okay? or the last one, well, depending on where you look at that. What is the notation that we use for that? Omega. So we use omega, okay, or N. You can sometimes find the N notation, which is exactly the same thing. In the case of arachidonic acid, it's omega, does anyone know? It's omega six. And what does this omega notation tell us? Okay, so omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, so it denotes the last carbon, whichever it is. And the, the six means that the first double bond from the end of the molecule, not from the beginning. The beginning, what is carbon number one? No. Which one is carbon number one? It's, it's the carboxylic group, right? That has the highest priority in naming, so that's gonna be carbon number one. But we're talking about the end carbon on the other side of the, um, uh, of, of the molecule. And omega-6 means that it's the six, that the double bond, the first double bond is on the sixth carbon from the end of the molecule, not from the beginning of the molecule. There's some reason behind it, and hopefully we'll get to that why this weird notation is there. Right, so we have the position, we now know the position of the first double bond, or the last, okay. Why is that enough to tell us where all the other double bonds are? They're like regular. They are regular, and in what? Yes, indeed, they are every three carbons. So they are not conjugated, okay. The majority of, let's say, normal fatty acids that we produce do not have conjugated double bonds, but in fact, the double bonds are separated always by one CH2 group. CH2 group. So as you say correctly, they start every third carbon. Okay, one, two, three, okay. Does it make sense? So the majority of fatty acids look like this, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Of course, they do exist conjugated fatty acids, they do exist in nature, only our body can't produce them. So we kind of assume when we're using this omega notation, we assume that all the double bonds look like this, that they are separated by one CH2 and they are all, well they are unconjugated, but they are all in what configuration? They're all cis, okay? Again, we do have trans fatty acids. They do exist in nature, they do exist in diet, in the diet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but when we use this, we assume that they are all cis, and we assume that they are all separated by one CH2. Therefore, just this one number tells us that this is in, in, in fact arachidonic acid, because we if we if these assumptions are true, then the only possible acid that that you know is described by this by this formula, by this notation, is the arachidonic acid, right? This, this is all just revision from, from first course, so hopefully it's not completely new, but it's fairly important that we all understand it so that we can get further uh, in, the, in the synthesis. So this is arachidonic acid. From the point of view of human biology, arachidonic acid is considered to be 
but what? Long. Long. It, it is quite long, indeed. Uh, but the word I'm looking for is essential. Okay, so it, it belongs in the group of essential fatty acids which need to be taken up in the diet. However, these essential fatty acids can be converted to some extent to one another. So arachidonic acid, while it is good if it's in the diet, the majority of arachidonic acid, I mean, arachidonic acid is actually not that common in nature. Okay? It's, you can find it in some nuts, etc., but it's not actually that common. So the majority of arachidonic acid that we have in our cells, in our body, is synthesized from some other essential fatty acid. Okay, so these fatty acids can be interchanged, can be changed from, uh, from one to another. So most of arachidonic acid is actually derived from a different acid. Does anyone know what is this other essential fatty acid that we can derive? It's not alpha linolenic. Okay, we'll get to omega-3 in a second. Hmm? Sorry? You... Oleic? No. Well, I'll explain why we can't do it from oleic acid. Okay, gamma linolenic would be a possibility. Okay. Uh, but actually, we can start from linoleic acid. Okay. But before we get to that, I can see that there is uh, something that probably sh should be explained as well. Now, the omega-6 acids, like arachidonic acid, are considered essential. We can't synthesize them. Why can't we synthesize them? Our body can synthesize double bonds or produce double bonds up to ninth carbon. Mm -hmm. So they contain more, I mean, double bonds that after ninth carbon as well. So maybe that can be... Yeah, that is indeed the explanation. Okay, So the way we synthesize polyunsaturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids in our body is we take a fatty acid and we introduce a double bond. Does anyone know what this enzyme is called or what the group of enzymes are called that do this? It's called desaturase and elongates, elongates it, but it's called desaturase. So we have desaturases that introduce a double bond. And these desaturases differ depending on to which position they can put the double bond. Okay? Now, the longest desaturase, in a way, so the desaturase that can put the double bond as far as possible from the carboxy end is delta 9 desaturase. The delta notation, and again, that's something you've already heard, tells us the actual positions of the double bond, of the double bonds, okay? So for arachidonic acid, which is C24 omega-6, the actual positions of double bonds, you don't need to know that, but you could count it if you wanted. But it's actually delta 5, delta 8, delta 11, delta 14. So we're counting from the carboxyl. Is that something that's clear for the delta notation? Okay, we're not counting from the end. We're counting from the beginning, from carboxyl end. So anyway, so delta 9 is the, the longest desaturase that we have. Okay, so... What is the usual fatty acid that is synthesized in the synthesis of fatty acids? Hmm? What is the, the usual final product of fatty acid synthesis? It's palmitic acid. Okay, it's palmitic acid. How many carbons does it have? 16 carbons, right? So let's take palmitic acid, 16 carbons. Okay, so that's the shortest one that we can use, basically. And we use delta-9 desaturase on it. So we make a double bond at delta 9. What is the resulting acid? It's not oleic acid. Not even that. Definitely not that. It's called palmito oleic acid. Okay, oleic acid has 18 carbons. Okay, so it's going to be called palmito oleic acid. That's not important now, okay? What is important, and now I really want you to think about it, this palmito oleic acid, which is C16-1, right? We made it from palmitic acid by one desaturase step. What is going to be the omega notation? And don't shout it, just think about it for a bit, okay? What is going to be the omega notation in this case? It's a delta-9 desaturase. It's going to be the omega. Just think about it for a minute, okay? Imagine the whole molecule, 
Okay, so what are the suggestions? What do you think? Okay, so there's a suggestion of seven. Any other? Huh? Well, it is going to be delta eight, but I'm asking about the omega notation. Of course, it's going to be delta eight because it was delta. Uh, sorry, delta nine uh, because the delta nine desaturates. But I'm talking about omega. So there's a suggestion of of omega seven. Any other suggestions? It's omega eight, omega six. So how would you come about figuring it out? Just tell me. Well, you could draw the structure, of course. Uh, that's the easiest way, okay? But in total, we have 16 carbons, right? We have 16 carbons. We put a double bond from this end, or whichever end, at carbon number nine, okay? So it's gonna be between carbon number nine and, uh, and carbon number 10, okay? So going from the other end, No, it's omega seven. It's omega seven. Okay, now it's more important. I don't care about palmitoleic acid. What I care about is that you understand how to figure it out, okay? Hopefully, at least some of you got how to do this, okay? So anyway, so it's omega seven. And this is basically the the furthest that we can put the double bond in. Now when we elongate it, for example, by two carbons, so we get C18, one, we're gonna get... No, the omega doesn't change because the elongation, the elongation always occurs at the carboxy end. Okay, sorry, COOH. Okay, so when we elongate, we add two carbons, but always at the carboxy end. So the omega can't change, it will never change. We can't make it any shorter, we can't make it any long, well, we can, well, we can't make it any longer either, all right? So this is the reason why omega six, omega three, omega five, omega four, all of these cannot be synthesized in our body. Yeah? We do have shorter desaturases. We have, I think there's delta four, delta five, which would make something like omega, whatever, 12 or something, okay? But let's, do you understand the principle? Now it's not about palmitoleic acid or whatever. I'm just trying to explain why all omega six, all omega three, all omega five, omega four, omega two, omega one, in theory, cannot be synthesized in our body because we, the largest desaturase that we have is delta nine. Yeah, all right, okay, hopefully it's, it's been understood at least by some of you. Because once you, again, once you get this principle in, you don't have to remember anything, you don't have to memorize anything, you just understand how these things work. So let's hope so. All right, so going back to where we were, I said that arachidonic acid can be synthesized from starting from linoleic acid, okay? And linoleic acid is, what is, if we use this notation, linoleic acid is? Does anyone know? C18, C18, number of double bonds? <laughs> so how many, how many? There are two, okay, C18 two, omega. Well, it can't be omega-3 because we need to synthesize an omega-6 acid. And we can't start with omega-3 and make it into omega-6 because how would we do that, right? Okay, so once we have omega-6, we can only make omega-6 acids out of it. Once we have omega-3, we can only make omega-3 acids out of that because there's no way to put a double bond anywhere else, okay? Yeah, so it's omega-6 because we need to make an omega-6 acid. All right, so this is linoleic acid, which is actually pretty common in all sorts of vegetable oils and nuts, et cetera, et cetera. So we do usually, even normal in a normal diet, we get plenty of linoleic acid, okay? The other uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids are usually much, much less than that, 
Uh, right. So how do we, what kind of steps do we have to take to turn a linoleic acid to arachidonic acid? Okay, is that enough? No. Right, so we need to elongate and we need to desaturate, right? Okay, so first what we can do is to desaturate it, okay? Which gives us what? C18, three, and of course omega-6, there's nothing we can do about that, right? Does anyone know what this, what this acid is called? It's a linolenic acid, but there are actually two different kinds of linolenic acid. There's alpha, and there is, there is gamma, okay? And this is gamma linolenic. And the difference is that alpha linolenic acid is actually omega-3 acid. It's the same thing, but it's omega-3. So it's a completely different acid. The, the two acids have basically almost nothing in common, right? One is omega-6, the other one is omega-3. Uh, but for some historic reasons, they're called alpha linolenic and gamma linolenic. They could have been called by completely different names, but somebody just, yeah. They probably couldn't, for a long time, they couldn't separate them, or they looked like the, they're the same thing. I don't know. So anyway, so this is gamma linolenic acid. Right, so what we do next is we elongate it. So we add two carbons to the carboxy end. What do we get from that? C20, three, omega six, right? No change in the double bonds, no change in the omega because there's nothing we can do about that, right? Right? So this is desaturase, this is elongase. And now we can obviously just do another desaturation step. And we have arachidonic acid. Okay, so this is the way how from a relatively abundant linole linoleic acid we can make arachidonic acid that we need for all sorts of purposes. Of course, we could start with gamma linolenic acid, which is also present in some seeds of plants, etc., in some vegetable oils, etc. So we could start at any point. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you what this name is, uh, what the name of this compound is, and that is called dihomo gamma linolenic gamma linolenic acid. Dihomo means that we added two CH2 groups. It's a general thing that we can use in, in organic chemistry nomenclature, okay? If you remember when we talk about the product of degradation of dopamine, the product of degradation of dopamine? It was like two weeks ago, wasn't it? Degradation of dopamine? homovanillic acid, okay? So it, is, it differs from vanillic acid by one CH2 group. That's why it's called homovanillic acid, okay? So we, here we have dihomogamalinolenic acid because it has two CH2 groups, two carbons added to it, basically, right? And finally here is arachidonic acid as the end. All right, so this is how we make arachidonic acid and in fact in our tissues, generally in our cells, the majority of polyunsaturated fatty acids are as arachidonic acid, okay? So we have a lot of it, even though in the diet there is not a huge amount of it. Now, where in the cells do we have arachidonic acid? Where do we find arachidonic acid? Where is it stored? Hmm? In lipid droplets? Not really, no. Mitochondria. Huh? Sorry? In membranes, okay, in membranes. And what structures are membranes made of? Phospholipids, all right? So the majority of polyunsaturated fatty acids in our cells are in phospholipids. So they could be in mitochondria, okay? Not so much in lipid droplets, but there might be some, okay? But the majority are in the membranes, in membrane phospholipids. So before we can use this C20 acid to make eicosanoids, see, we still haven't got to eicosanoids, we're still preparing the, the raw material, 
So before we get to that, we have to release this arachidonic acid from the phospholipid. And for that, we need an enzyme called, what are the enzymes that can hydrolyze phospholipids? The enzymes that hydrolyze phospholipids? Hmm? Phospholipases, right? There are phospholipases. Yeah, you've heard of phospholipases before. All right. So if we take a phospholipid, some kind of phospholipid, okay, so phospholipid has an alcohol called, we're talking about glycerol phospholipids, so alcohol called glycerol, okay, it has What? Two fatty acids by bound by an ester bond, okay, to it. And what else is there? And there's a phosphate group. And and okay, and something else, what is usually called a base, and it could be choline, it could be ethanolamine, it could be serine, it could be phosphatidylanositol, bisphosphate, etc. etc. Okay? A lot of you are looking at me like I've never ever seen this before, but hopefully this should be something that you know by heart, okay? Anyway, so in this molecule of a phospholipid, we actually have how many, how many bonds that can be hydrolyzed do you see? There are four, there are four, okay? This is also an ester bond, okay? So there are four ester bonds in total. So we can have four different enzymes, four different phospholipases that will uh, hydrolyze these individual bonds. And you know already about one of these phospholipases. Which one? That's a hormone sensitive lipase. Okay, and we're talking about phospholipases. So you know phospholipase C, okay, which is important in signaling through phospholipase C, signaling through GQ, very good. Okay, GQ protein. Yeah, all right. Which of these bonds does phospholipase C cleave? This is bond number one, number two, number three, number four. Okay, so there's a suggestion of number four. And there's a suggestion of number three. Any other suggestions? Or four, okay. So who thinks, just raise your hand, who thinks that it's number three that is hydrolyzed? Okay. Who thinks that it's number four that's hydrolyzed? Okay. Who doesn't want to raise your hand now? A lot of people, yeah? All right. Okay. So it's number three, okay. The bond number three is hydrolyzed by phospholipase C. How do you know that? Well, because from phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, you make inositol trisphosphate which means that the phosphate group has to go with inositol because we're kind of adding one more phosphate to it, right? So it has to be, uh, it has to be this one. Well, anal analogically, we also have phospholipase D, which hydrolyzes this one, this bond. What would be the product if phospholipase D acted on phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate? It would be phosphatidic acid and yes. Well, it can't be the acylglycerol. We also have phosphatidic acid, which is this whole thing, right? This is phosphatidic acid, so that's one part of it. And the other part is, is inositol bisphosphate, right? So when we use phospho phospholipase D, we will get phosphatidic acid and inositol bisphosphate. If we use phospholipase C, we get inositol trisphosphate and acylglycerol, because this phosphate group goes away. Okay, this is why knowing the structures is actually pretty helpful because then you can understand 
what is going on. All right. But here we're not interested in phospholipase C and D, we're actually interested in phospholipase A1 and phospholipase A2. And in fact, the enzyme that we're really interested in is phospholipase A2 because the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are then used to synthesize eicosanoids are almost always in the second position in the phospholipid. Okay, so the first position is usually a saturated fatty acid, and the second position is often a polyunsaturated fatty acid, such as our ketonic acid. All right? So we have to, in order to even think about synthesizing eicosanoids, we first have to use phospholipase A2 to release our ketonic acid from the phospholipid, and then we can start doing other stuff with it. Okay, so basically the first step that we have to do after synthesizing and putting the arachidonic acid in phospholipids, we have to release it using phospholipase A2. Right? And we'll see towards the end of the lecture why this is important, because we can use medication to block phospholipase A2 and stop the production of eicosanoids, but we'll see that towards the end. All right, well, now that we have arachidonic acid, we can finally start making eicosanoids. And what kind of eicosanoids can we make? Well, they can be divided into two major groups depending on the pathway that they take, that the arachidonic acid takes. The one pathway is called cyclical pathway or cyclizing pathway because it creates a cycle, okay? And that pathway creates prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Prostaglandins and thromboxanes. So that's the cyclical, that's the cyclizing pathway. That's a pathway that makes a cycle inside. Thromboxanes. Okay. The other pathway is called a linear pathway because it doesn't create any cycle. And that produces leukotrienes and lipoxins. Lipoxins. Now, when I say that it creates a cycle, well, basically, if you imagine the fatty acid looking something like this, bent over in half, okay? What happens in these processes, and we'll talk about some of the enzymes, what happens is that in the cyclical pathway, the two sides become joined and they create a cycle, usually a five-membered one, not as big as I showed here, okay? But they create a cycle. So all of these will contain a, a cycle where the carbons are connected together, okay? In linear pathway, nothing like that happens. Okay, so that's, that's a big difference between the two pathways. Now, the cyclizing, the cyclical pathway, is started by enzymes called cyclooxygenases. Cyclooxygenases. The, this is the, the name of the enzymes. There are a few of them, and we'll talk about them in a second. Um, this is the name that is very current, very commonly used in literature, usually pharmacological literature. The correct name of the enzyme is actually prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase. Yeah. Sometimes you can also find it as prostaglandin H synthase. The correct name that is used by the official nomenclature is called prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase because it creates an endoperoxide somewhere in the molecule. It's not really important. So prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase or prostaglandin H synthase because the first product of cyclooxygenase is prostaglandin H, which then gets turned by other enzymes into all the other products. Okay, so the first product of cyclooxygenase reaction is prostaglandin H, 
and then it gets turned to all the other ones by many, many other enzymes which we won't really talk about, okay, because they're complicated. Okay, so we can have prostaglandin H, which is the first one. It can be turned to prostaglandin D and prostaglandin F and prostaglandin E, et cetera, et cetera. And to thromboxanes, which also have some notations. Let's not worry about them too much. Okay, so cyclooxygenase or prostaglandin peroxide synthase is the first one. The linear pathway starts also by a common set of enzymes called lipooxygenases. So not cyclooxygenases, but lipooxygenases. Again, there are several types of them. And they all produce a starting substance, which, so the similar way to cyclooxygenase, which produces prostaglandin H, the lipooxygenases produce a compound, or actually set of compounds, called hydroperoxy eicosa tetraenoic acid. It sounds really complicated, but it really isn't, because eicosatetraenoic acid is eicosatetraenoic acid is arachidonic acid, right? That's what we started with. And we just add a hydroperoxy to it, which just means there's going to be an OOH hanging of it. That's all. So hydroperoxy eicosatetraenoic acid sounds really, really complicated, but it really isn't. It just means it's arachidonic acid and there's OOH hanging of it. That's it, in various positions, but let's not worry about that. Okay? And this hydroperoxy eicosatetraenoic acid, actually one of them, gets turned by many other enzymes to leukotrienes and to lipoxins. Is this kind of general, uh, general scheme of how eicosanoids are synthesized and how they differ between each other chemically and metabolically, is, is that clear? Yeah, a cyclical pathway, a cyclizing pathway, a linear pathway, and we get the, the, the different kinds of eicosanoids there. Do you have any questions about the first part of the lecture? This was much more, the first part was really about you understanding how things work, not so much you know, learning the facts. The second half, it's gonna be more about learning various names and et cetera, et cetera. So do you have any questions about the principles? Because if you do, ask them now, because it's gonna make it easier later on. Yeah? Uh, just from when we went in the process of making the arachidonic acid, when we went from the linolate to the gamma linolenic acid. Linolenic. Linolenic acid, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, how exactly did the... So, so we used a desaturase and we just added another double bond so to the molecule. The yeah. And it's not really that important, oh, okay. but <laughs> you don't really need to know that, okay? One of the desaturases was used. Okay. Any other questions? All clear? Sort of. All right. So let's take a three minute break. I think people are already leaving for the break, so we can just discuss it here if you want. Another desaturase, correct. All right, any further questions? Right, uh, okay. The they will be uploaded soon-ish. I just need a little bit of time to edit them. But the old ones, the ones from last year, are the same, basically, that they were this year. So, you know. But they will be, hopefully, up as soon as possible. The, the, le the video lectures. Um, any further questions to the beginning? I mean, some of the questions that I got during the break maybe suggest that I wasn't as clear as I intended to be. So. Do ask now if there are some fundamental misunderstandings. Yep. Okay, you said so the desaturated that can add the double bond in the farthest uh, position yes. is in delta 9. Correct. Right? What if this delta 9 is added to a 12 carbon fatty acid? Yes, then we could produce a omega 3 or whatever. Okay, so why you said the 7 is the smallest? Yeah, because palmitic acid is the shortest. Or sorry, the yeah, 
we, we can only basically work with desaturases from palmitic acid to longer ones. So the shorter ones are not a substrate for these desaturases. So you mean for the shortest, there will be also a shorter uh, desaturase? Like not really. So we have a set of desaturases. I think there are four in the, in the human body. The delta-9 is the longest one. But they will take palmitic acid or longer, which means that we can't produce omega-6 or omega-9. They will not take a shorter fatty acid because actually in our body they're not really produced. We produce palmitic acid in the synthesis of fatty acids. Okay. Any other questions? No. All right. Well, what do these eicosanoids actually do? Now, of course, you can see that there are a lot of them. Okay. These are just the groups, but as I said, there are plenty of prostaglandins, there are plenty of thromboxanes, plenty of leukotrienes, plenty of lipoxanes. So they, there are many, many different versions of these eicosanoids, and they will have different effects. Of course, in order for a signaling molecule to have an effect, we have to have a receptor. And again, similar to many other signaling molecules, there are many different receptors for these. Okay? There are at least 10 prostaglandin receptors, there are many receptors for thromboxanes, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, many, we're not going to talk about the specific types of receptors here, but you can imagine that with a different type of receptor, there will be different effects depending on, on what, the, what the signaling cascades are. All the receptors for all the eicosanoids are G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so they all have the same basic type of a signaling cascade. They're all G-protein coupled receptors. Now, what do they do? Well. The uh, prostaglandins, we could say, are responsible to a large degree for all the classical signs of inflammation. Okay? So the majority of them, of the signs, are mediated by prostaglandins. So what we get there is vasodilation. Okay? So blood vessels are dilated, which means that more blood flows through the area. Again, there's a logic behind it, right? If, if there's a damage, we want to get as much blood in there so that we can get white blood cells there, et cetera, et cetera, for the healing or for fighting infection. So there's vasodilation. There is pain. And while prostaglandins themselves usually do not directly cause pain, they make the, the area much more sensitive to some other painful stimuli. And you probably, again, know that if you have something that's inflamed, it may not necessarily hurt very much on its own, but once you hit it or once you touch it with something, then it hurts, even though normally it wouldn't. So prostaglandins are responsible for sensitizing nerve endings, which carry pain, to make them more sensitive to whatever stimuli there are. Okay? So we have redness and heat, which is the increased blood flow caused by vasodilation. We have increased pain. And the swelling generally is just caused that by the vasodilation and by making the capillaries and some of the blood vessels more leaky. So they start leaking out the, uh, the extracellular fluid into the, into the interstitial area, basically, and that causes swelling. Okay? So all these signs are caused by prostaglandins, or the majority of them are, caused by, are mediated by, by prostaglandins. However, prostaglandins themselves have many, many, many other functions. For example, prostaglandins are responsible for stimulating the production of mucus in the, in the stomach. What is, what is, why do we need mucus in the stomach? Correct. We need to protect the, the lining of the stomach from the juices, from the gastric juice, which would, which would otherwise start digesting it, right? There's the acid, there are the enzymes, etc. So there's actually a layer of mucus which protects it, okay? And we need prostaglandins, locally produced prostaglandins. Now, as you can see, that has nothing to do with inflammation. We need these prostaglandins all the time in order to produce enough mucus, okay? So having said that prostaglandins are responsible for mediating a large part of inflammation does not mean that every time there are prostaglandins, there has to be an inflammation. There are actually a lot of what we call housekeeping functions of prostaglandins that are necessary all the time, irrespective of inflammation. So they regulate the production of mucus in the, uh, in, in the stomach. They also are responsible, together with other signaling molecules, to regulate the blood flow in the kidneys. Okay? So in the glomerulus, where we need to have certain pressures and certain blood flow, 
in order for the kidneys to work, to actually you know, clean the blood from all the, all the stuff that we don't want, prostaglandins are very important to set these pressures and to set blood flow uh, correctly. Prostaglandins are also very important in initiating um, labor, initiating childbirth, okay? So they do stimulate the, sen they se sensitize the smooth muscles in the uterus so that it can start contracting and, and uh, you know, expelling the baby from the, uh, from the womb, okay? So again, a very important function of prostaglandin, and it's something that is actually used therapeutically to initiate childbirth or to initiate abortion, okay? So we can, we can use prostaglandins or the derivatives uh, for, for these, uh, uh, for these um, functions. Um, yes? Oxytocin is also used, but it, it, it's a completely different thing. Okay, so oxytocin, oxytocin, what is, what is it? Where does it come from? From the pituitary, so it's a pituitary hormone. It's actually a, a protein, okay? So it has, it has nothing to do with these, but it, it's also one other factor that does influence, it, that plays a role in childbirth, okay? So it's not all prostaglandins, but they are very important and we can, we can influence them. Right. Um, thromboxanes have a much smaller range of effects. Actually, the majority of thromboxanes are produced in the platelets, and they are there to initiate platelet aggregation, okay? So when platelets need, need to aggregate, when there is damage to tissue and we need to stop bleeding, platelets that are activated produce thromboxanes to start aggregating together uh, and also initiating some other things, okay? So thromboxanes are much less uh, have a much smaller range of effects, okay? But again, they are very important and we'll talk about some pharmacological ways of influencing them. Uh, unlike prostaglandins, which can be produced almost in any tissue in the body, thromboxanes are mostly produced in the, in the platelets and leukotrienes and lipoxins are practically only expressed, only produced in immune cells, okay? So they are really much more about immune signaling while prostaglandins, as we just described, do all sorts of things, okay? So these two groups, leukotrienes and lipoxins, are really, really specific to the immune system and to, to inflammation. Leukotrienes have been implicated in the development of asthma, at least some types of asthma, okay? So, and there are actually even drugs that block leukotriene receptors and that can help with certain subset of asthma attacks. It's not a, uh, a silver bullet, that's what they thought. They thought that they would develop a drug against leukotrienes and asthma would be uh, cured, but that's not what happens at all. So it only works in a very small subset of patients, but, but leukotrienes have been implicated in this inflammation that causes asthma, asthma uh, attacks. And lipoxins have a large range of effects in inflammation and are also in the resolution of inflammation, so in healing the inflammation, lots of different effects, and we, we don't really need to go into a huge amount of detail. Right. Now we're moving slowly towards this pharmacology of inflammation, or how to prevent inflammation, inflammation. but uh, there was actually a question in, during the break which I do want to address. Uh, somebody brought their, um, their workbook and said that it says prostaglandin H2 there. Okay, so what is, what is this 2? Well, the 2 says basically that this prostaglandin H has two double bonds. That's what it means. Okay, there are two double bonds there. Why is that important? Well, in the action of cyclooxygenase, two double bonds are destroyed through the oxidation and adding oxygens, et cetera. So two double bonds are got rid of. So when we start from arachidonic acid, which has four double bonds, and two double bonds are destroyed, we end up with two double bonds. All right? Do you agree? Good. So all prostaglandins and all thromboxanes which are derived from arachidonic acid, will have this index 2. So we would get PGD2 and PGE2 and thromboxane A2, et cetera, et cetera. So everything that is derived from arachidonic acid will have this index 2 because it has two double bonds. It comes from arachidonic acid. What if 
instead of arachidonic acid, we, didn't, we started with dihomogamalinolenic acid. It has also 20 carbons, so it can be used. What set of prostaglandins and thromboxanes would we get from dihomogamalinolenic acid? It would be one, because dihomogamalinolenic acid only has three double bonds, and since two are destroyed in the cyclooxygenase reaction, we're left with one. So we can also have PGH1, which is derived from dihomogamalinolenic acid. If we start with dihomogamalinolenic acid, all of these will have a subscript one. We can also start with a fatty acid that has five double bonds. For example, we could start with eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, which is a C25 omega-3 acid. It comes from, you can actually see it in those supplements, omega-3 supplements, oftentimes they contain EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, okay, and, or docosahexaenoic as well. Okay? So from EPA, what kind of subscript would, you, would we use if we start with EPA? Three, right? So we would get PGH three, and all of them would be three, because two double bonds are destroyed. We started with five, so we have three. So this is just an explanation of these, of these subscripts, which you see in the uh, eicosanoid nomenclature. Um, for the linear pathway, it's different, okay? Because it's not two double bonds that are destroyed. The numbers are different, okay? But it works. The logic behind it is the same, but yeah, we get slightly different numbers, okay? So this is just an explanation why we have PGH two there but we could also have any of the other ones. This idea also explains why in, well, even in medical literature, but more so in popular literature, you hear about these omega-3 supplements that, wh why are they used? What are they used for? Well, nowadays they're used for like everything, but what is the general idea behind omega-3 supplements? Fish oils and all these things? You must have heard about it, yeah? Yeah, indeed. So, so the, the idea behind it is if you take fish oils, um, you will decrease the, the risk of heart disease. Why is that? Well, because the, the uh, eicosanoids, which are derived from eicosapentaenoic acid, especially the thromboxanes, so TXA3, are less effective on their receptors. They don't bind as, as well to the receptors as the ones with the, uh, with the subscript 2. Are slightly different, well, there's one double bond different, right? Um, so they are not as effective. And the idea behind it is that if we have less effective thromboxanes, we don't get as much platelet aggregation, which decreases the risk of heart attack. Well, uh, in most literature, you find that, yes, indeed, it's true. However, in January, there was a big, big, big study in New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that there's absolutely no effect which was done in, in tens of thousands of patients and they couldn't find any effect whatsoever, uh, which was like a big revolution because for decades everybody was saying, that, well, of course, EPA, omega-3, they're so good for you and they decrease heart, uh, the, the risk of heart attack. But yeah, this a huge, huge study published just a couple of months ago showed that there is no effect. So that's kind of interesting. So All right. Sorry? So well, it appears so, yes. But it's definitely, good, it's definitely good business for anybody who's producing it. Right, so let's now move on how, how we can influence uh, the inflammation. And there are actually several different ways, and many of the drugs that we'll talk about are drugs that you know quite well. And we'll start with a very large group of medications that are many, 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 many members of this group called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, drugs or NSAIDs. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And the prototypical drug, the oldest one from this group, this molecule, it's not ibuprofen, no, 
It's called acetosalicylic acid or aspirin. Okay, aspirin is a company name. Okay, it's a brand name. Okay, so we shouldn't really be calling it aspirin, but everybody does because it, it's existed for about 150 years or something like that. Um, but it's really called acetylsalicylic acid. Okay, that's the real name that should be used. Uh, so this is something that was discovered in the 19th century or isolated from a plant, from a tree or whatever tree bark, uh, and now it's quite commonly used. Now, it's been, it, it was used for decades, if not maybe 100 years or something, before it was discovered what its mechanism of effect actually is. And now we know that aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid, is an inhibitor of cyclooxygenase. So it's a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. It's a completely non-selective, and when I say non-selective, it means that it inhibits all types of cyclooxygenase. Now, I haven't really mentioned the types, but they are very important for understanding the effects of NSAIDs and also their side effects. Why is that? Because we, in fact, have two main isoenzymes of cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. Cyclooxygenase 1 is this housekeeping enzyme. It's an enzyme that's expressed in most tissues, and it does all these things that we mentioned, like regulating mucus production in the stomach and regulating um, uh, the contractility of smooth muscle in the uterus and regulating blood flow in the glomeruli, etc., etc. On the other hand, cyclooxygenase 2 is the enzyme that is upregulated in inflammation. Okay? So why COX-1 is everywhere all the time, COX-2 is really upregulated when there's inflammation. All right? So in theory, what we want are COX-2-specific inhibitors, because if we have a uh, non-selective inhibitor, then we will cause side effects by giving NSAIDs to people. Right? What would be the side effects? Well, the most typical one, and that's something maybe you've heard about, what is the, the, the most typical side effect of taking these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? Does anyone know? Stomachache. Yeah, well, stomachache is not such a big problem, but actually we could get... We can get bleeding into the gastrointestinal tract, so bleeding from the stomach, which is caused by, logically, by inhibiting the production of prostaglandins, we inhibit the production of mucus, and the gastric juice can start digesting the wall of the stomach. So we can get a gastric ulcer, we can get bleeding, and sometimes it can actually you know, be potentially fatal or very, very serious. Okay? So these non-selective NSAIDs will have all these side effects, bleeding into the GI tract, we could have problems with blood flow in the kidneys, okay? We could also, and that's quite an interesting thing, if we block this pathway, we leave more arachidonic acid for this pathway. And in fact, in some patients, not in many, but there are some patients who can have asthma attack when they take aspirin or some other non-selective uh, NSA. Because suddenly there's more arachidonic acid available to produce leukotrienes, which causes them to have an asthma attack. So we have to be careful in people with asthma when you're giving them these drugs, because they, they might be okay, but some of them might be too sensitive to it. And this is the explanation that's usually given, given that when you block the cyclooxygenase pathway, there's actually more left for producing all these other um, potentially pro-inflammatory or pro-asthmatic pro um, mediators. So going back to aspirin, it's a non-selective non -selective, uh, inhibitor, just one second, non-selective inhibitor of cyclooxygenase. And what's also important is that it's an irreversible inhibitor. So it actually binds to the active site of cyclooxygenase, all of them, I mean both of them. There's also cyclooxygenase 3, but let's not worry about that. Um, so aspirin goes into the active site, binds there, and this acetyl group covalently binds into the active site and kills the enzyme. The enzyme is, is no longer working. So it's an irreversible non-selective uh, inhibitor. Yes? Yeah, well, aspirin blocks cyclooxygenase. So if we block this pathway, 
we have more arachidonic acid left to produce leukotrienes and lipoxins, which are implicated in starting an asthma attack. But again, it's not in all people with asthma, but some people can be quite sensitive to this. Yep? Yep. Well, because we, we blocked this whole pathway, right? It's a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. Well, none of the ones that are produced through cyclooxygenase. This is, these are produced by lipooxygenases, and this and aspirin does not inhibit lipooxygenases. It only inhibits cyclooxygenase. Yes. Yeah, that's the idea that some people get asthma when they take aspirin. Yeah, so in this case, we that well, we could do, yes, we, we could do that, yes. To treat them, yes. There was another question here? No? Well, COX-2 is, is the one that's implicated in inflammation. So it's actually upregulated in inflammation. When inflammation is going on, COX-2 is going to be upregulated and will start producing prostaglandins and thromboxanes there. Just one second, yeah. Is what? Bleeding? Yes, in theory. When you take, for example, aspirin, which will and will get to that in a second, but which will block also the synthesis of thromboxanes, there is an increased, increased risk of bleeding or longer bleeding. Yes, that's true. Yep. So patients also, uh, when they have signs of heart attack, they take aspirin to... Yes, they do. Why? Because in heart attack, what you have is that the blood starts clotting on the atheroma plaque, basically, inside the blood vessel. And by giving them aspirin, you slow down the aggregation of platelets on it, and you can at least, you know, uh, decrease the damage that otherwise would be caused. All right. So, aspirin, non-selective irreversible inhibitor. Why am I so emphasizing that it's irreversible? Well, you may have heard that aspirin is taken preventively, as a prevention of heart attack by people over 50 or 60 or whatever. Have you heard of that? Yes. No? Okay. It's, it's something that, that people take because there are large studies that show that, they, that taking aspirin decreases the risk. Now, the doses of aspirin that are, taken as a that are taken as a prevention are much lower than the dose of aspirin that you would take if you have a headache or some inflammation. Do you know how much aspirin you would normally take? One tablet? How much there is? Really? It's 500 milligrams usually, okay? It's half a gram. But for the prevention of heart attack, you normally take about 100 milligrams or even 60 milligrams, especially in the United States, the recommendation is 60 milligrams, okay? So it's 10 times less. Why is that? Well, since aspirin is an irreversible inhibitor, it will go into the platelets, inhibit cyclooxygenase in the platelets where they produce thromboxanes, and since platelets are not real cells, they're just fragments of cells, once the enzyme is inhibited, they can't make any more because they're not a real cell. They don't have a nucleus, right? So they can't make any more of the enzyme, and the enzyme is blocked for the whole duration of existence of the platelet. With the rest of the tissues, when we take just 100 milligrams, the rest of the tissues just make new enzyme, and they don't care about it. So when we want to have an anti-inflammatory effect somewhere in the body, we have to take the 50, or the 500 milligram or whatever, or even more, we have to take two aspirins to have an effect. But for platelets, and this is something that we're interested in when we're trying to prevent heart attack, we can use a much, much, much lower dose because the platelets cannot make any more enzyme. Now, a lot of you are looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. So ask a question. No, I can't repeat the whole thing. Which is, which is the part you don't understand? That's the whole thing. Okay? So the platelets are not real cells. They can't synthesize a new enzyme, right? Do you agree with that? Okay. Now, if we use an irreversible inhibitor, we block the enzyme forever 
and the cell has to make a new one in order to start producing prostaglandins. But platelets cannot do that. They're not real cells. Okay? So we can use a much lower dose because for the platelets, they won't make any more. The rest of the body will make more and your headache will come back if you just take a, a 100 milligrams. But for the platelets, they can't. They will be blocked until we make new ones. The same thing happens, but why would you take 500 milligrams if you don't have to, right? Because then you can have gastric bleeding, etc. You don't really want that. So you want to use as low a dose as possible in order to block the, the platelets from functioning. Is, is, is that difficult to understand or? Yeah? Yes, there is a slightly increased risk of bleeding, but most studies have shown that the risk of bleeding is much lower than the risk that you're preventing by, uh, by preventing the heart attack. So there is slightly increased risk of bleeding. Of course, we're not inhibiting the platelets completely, okay? It's just we're decreasing their ability to aggregate. Yeah, same, same question, yeah. all right, okay. Now, so th this is the significance of aspirin, why aspirin is so special, because it's irreversible. But of course, there are other molecules that are reversible inhibitors, and I'll just show this one. This is ibuprofen, okay? You can see that it looks pretty similar to aspirin. In fact, this aromatic ring, it binds into the active site and it pretends to be part of the fatty acid. because I told you that the fatty acid in these reactions actually bends over in, in half, and the end of the fatty acid looks like a ring. Okay, it's not really, but it's, it looks like a ring. So the aromatic ring actually sits into the place where these, these whole reactions with the fatty acid work. Can you imagine how that works? The, the polyunsaturated fatty acid just kind of bending in half, and you get the end which will look like a ring. Okay, and this is, so these aromatic rings pretend to be the end of the, of the fatty acid, and then they do something to the enzyme. So this is ibuprofen. Uh, the name actually tells you most about the structure because this is isobutyl, ibu, isobutyl ring, uh, isobutyl chain, okay. This is propionic acid, ibu, pro, and this is a, a benzene ring, so a phenyl, let's say. Okay, so ibuprofen just tells you about that. Ibuprofen does the same thing, but it's, it's a reversible inhibitor. Again, non-selective. It will inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, so it still does have the side effects of aspirin. Slightly less pronounced, but, but also are there. Okay, so it's a non-selective one, but it's a reversible. So we can't use a low-dose ibuprofen for the prevention of heart attack, okay? It wouldn't work. We would have to use a large, a high dose ibuprofen, and we don't want to do that because the side effects would be more serious than what we are preventing. Yeah. I don't know if you have the time for this question, but if in case we use all these uh, medications for just headache, is there like a specific, like, of course they're similar, but when do we do which? Right. Um, well, uh, first of all, if it's just for a headache, normally you would use the one that has the lowest risk of side effects which generally is ibuprofen. So ibuprofen is considered to have a relatively lower risk of, especially of GI bleeding, than all the other ones, especially if we're taking whatever 500, uh, 400 milligrams or something, which is not a very large dose, okay? There are people who have to take these drugs as anti-inflammatory drugs, so not for a headache or a little bit of pain or fever or something, uh, but they actually have to take it as anti-inflammatory drugs and they have to take much larger doses, several grams per day. And in that case, ibuprofen also has a fairly large risk of GI. So, so you would pick something that has a low, uh, low risk of side effects. But also some people will say, well, for me, really just aspirin works. For me, ibuprofen is not good enough. Then you have people for whom ibuprofen is much better. Depends what kind of pain it is. You know, for menstruation pain, you might use something else for various, you know, so it, it depends. Yeah. Now we're talking about this kind of generic indication for a headache or a fever. When there are indications as anti-inflammatory, anti then there are very specific guides, guidelines for what to use in, in what situation. Um, perhaps the most commonly used drug, which kind of looks like it belongs in the same group, is paracetamol. Uh, 
or acetaminophen for those who are from the US or been there. So this is paracetamol. Again, it looks the same. It actually looks very similar, let's say, to aspirin or whatever. However, paracetamol is not considered part of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because it doesn't seem to have very profound anti-inflammatory properties. So it will help with pain. It will help with fever. By the way, fever is produced also by prostaglandins, but prostaglandins that are produced in the hypothalamus. So they are produced in the brain where they set the thermostat to a different amount, basically to a different level. All right. So even though fever is mediated mostly by interleukin-1, which is produced in the body, it goes into the hypothalamus where prostaglandins are produced. That's why all of these drugs will also decrease fever, because they block the production of prostaglandins in the brain, just, just to explain that. So paracetamol will work against pain and will work against fever, but it's not a very good anti-inflammatory drug. Until recently, it was unknown what the mechanism of effect of paracetamol is. Okay, so it's probably the most prescribed drug potentially in, in the world, uh, but nobody knew how it actually worked. Now we know that it's a very strange inhibitor of COX, non-selective, but it has some very weird mechanics of its inhibition. That's why nobody knew about it. There are some weird details about that. But it appears that paracetamol also acts centrally because it can bind, and some of its uh, me metabolites can bind to the endocannabinoid system and to serotonin system. So when you take paracetamol, it will act by inhibiting COX to some extent, but it has also central effects. So it's, it's, it's a bit different from all the other drugs here. Right. So these are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. However, I mentioned that we really, really, in theory, we would like to be inhibiting just COX-2, right? So we would like to have selective COX-2 inhibitors. And they do exist. They are called COXIBs, which stands for COX inhibitors, meaning selective ones. And probably nowadays the, the most commonly used is called Selecoxib. These drugs are quite effective in the same way as these non-selective inhibitors are. They're a bit less effective, but they also have fewer side effects. So the idea behind COXIPS is that we'll only inhibit COX-2 and therefore will do away with all the side effects, right? But they do seem to have side effects. And in fact, the first COXIP that was put in the market, which was called Rofacoxib, had to be withdrawn from the market because it was found that it actually increases quite significantly the, ros the, the risk of heart attack. So it does have a side effect, but a very different one. Okay? And the mechanism behind it is quite complicated. What is quite interesting was that the company that produced it, and I can't quite remember which one, is, which one it was, but the company that produced it actually knew about this side effect. So when they were doing the clinical trials, they noticed that there was an increased risk of heart attack. However, they still allowed it to be used to actually be put in the market. And in the end, hundreds, if not thousands of people died because of that. And there was a very, very large uh, trial afterwards. And I think they had to pay several billion dollars to the people or you know, to the families of the people who died because of, because of that. And it's quite interesting that they actually knew about it and they said, well, it's going to be fine. Uh, but it wasn't. So rofacoxib is no longer, uh, is, it's been withdrawn from the market. And even these other coxibs usually have a warning saying there is a potential increase in, 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 uh, in the risk of heart attack. Okay, so you have to be careful. What is a larger risk? Okay, GI bleeding. In some patients, that could be a big problem. Maybe there is an increased risk of, of, of a heart attack. All right. These are non-steroidal drugs. Why are they called non-steroidal? Because we also have steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these are glucocorticoids. 
glucocorticoids, glucocorticoid hormones, which are normally produced in the cortex of adrenal glands, have very, very powerful anti-inflammatory properties. How do they work? They inhibit phospholipase A2. They do it indirectly because, of course, you know that glucocorticoids, their mechanism of effect is how, what do they do? What, what kind of signaling cascades? Glucocorticoids? Glucocorticoids, what do they do? Huh? What? What is the mechanism of effect? Do they have a G protein? Do they have a tyrosine kinase receptor? What is the mechanism of effect? Glucocorticoids. They go in the, yeah, into the cell. And then to the nucleus. So they bind to a receptor, then they go to the nucleus and they influence transcription, right? So these glucocorticoids in this anti-inflammatory setting, they increase the production of proteins called lipocortins. Lipocortins. And these lipocortins are proteins that bind to phospholipase A2 and block it. So by giving glucocorticoids, and nowadays it's not just cortisol, but there are some very, very, very potent thousand times more potent derivatives than cortisol is, we can increase the production of lipocortins and block phospholipase A2. Now, if we block phospholipase A2, we block all the pathways of eicosanoid synthesis because there's no arachidonic acid released. So these are extremely powerful anti-inflammatory medications. However, they do have very significant side effects because, of course, Glucocorticoids have all sorts of other functions, not just this anti-inflammatory function, but many, many other functions in the liver, in the adipose tissue, in the skeletal muscle, etc. Okay, so these are usually n not used as the first choice because there are many, many side effects. All right, um, we will talk a little bit about uh, immunosuppressant drugs. So not anti-inflammatory, but immunosuppressant drugs, which are drugs that inhibit the immune system completely. But we'll talk about them when we, when we talk about the treatment of cancer. Okay, so when we talk about the treatment of cancer in whatever, three weeks time or something like that, uh, we'll mention some drugs that, are, that have very powerful immunosuppressant uh, effects, but let's leave that for, uh, for then. Any questions? There are glucocorticoids and there are many, 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 many different ones. No questions? Um, possibly, but with the glucocorticoids, there are many other side effects that they can have. But also, there there is the risk of bleeding as well. So, if we inhibit either of the parts, there is yes, like yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Only there's going to be more with with glucocorticoids. Okay.